Well, good morning. Good morning. Hi. Yes. So happy to be here. Grandpa. <laughs> I better look in the mirror. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just so proud of Hope for the World and you have made your mark in the lives and hearts of the poor and the hurting. And uh, for that, Jesus thanks you. And I affirm you and uh, your, your amazing amazing work for the Lord. I'm just so proud to be associated with you. I want to just talk a little bit about uh, making space for a miracle, making room for God in our lives. And uh, have you ever felt backed up in a corner? Like there's no, no way out. You feel trapped. You feel uh, deeply troubled. I came across, I thought these were kind of funny, just um, how you know it's going to be a tough day. You know it's going to be a tough day if you turn on the news and they're showing emergency routes out of the city. If you wake up to discover your water bed is broken, then realize you don't have a water bed. <laughs> if your horn goes off accidentally and you get stuck driving behind a group of Hell's Angels on the motorway, it might be a tough day. If you call suicide prevention and they put you on hold. If your income tax refund check bounces. If your wife says, good morning, Bill, and your name is George. <laughs> if your pet rock snaps at you. If your twin sister forgets your birthday. And your blind date turns out to be your ex-girlfriend who's going to call. <laughs> If the bird singing outside your window is a vulture, <laughs> if the pest exterminator climbs under your house and never comes out, if the restaurant gives you the senior discount and you're only 36 years old, <laughs> if you ask your wife if she'd like to go out to eat tonight and when you get home there's a sandwich on the porch. Anyhow, we all know seriously have days where things seem to all be going wrong. And many times we think, well, the problem, God, why don't you do something? But what I want to challenge you today with the thought is, God may be saying back to you, why don't you do something? Mm -hmm. Maybe the problem is not God's not moving, but maybe the problem is you're not prepared to receive what he's moving to do. In Psalms 81.10, do we have that verse? This uh, awesome verse. For it was the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide. Can you say, open your mouth wide? Open your mouth wide. And he's not talking about the dentist. Okay. <laughs> open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things. And the tradition tells us that when a general would come after a victory, sometimes the king would ask the general to kneel and say, he would say, open your mouth wide. And he would put in his mouth pearls or something of great worth. And so if you were a general, you knew that the more you opened your mouth, the more pearls you would get. And God says today, is your heart open wide? <laughs> Maybe you're not receiving as much as you want because your heart is not as open as wide as God could feel. And... This story is a little story I want to read now in Mark chapter 5, verse 22, about making room for God. So let's go to Mark 5, 22. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Now we're at verse 24. Let's keep going. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? 
His disciples said, to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask? Who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and told him what she had done. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Don't you love it when Jesus says, your suffering is over? That's going to happen to someone tonight. Today, he's going to say, go in peace from this service. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived, arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all the commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. Notice this one. He made them all leave. <laughs> How many know we need to get the unbelief out of the room? And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Believe the which means little girl, get up. Let's go on. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. How many know Jesus can totally amaze you? <laughs> Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he said, Give her something to eat. And what I want you to see here is. Jesus did a mighty miracle for, for Jairus. But she, this happened after Jairus made room for that miracle to come into his life. Jairus didn't just sit there when his daughter was sick. He began to ask himself, what can I do? What can I do that would invite the presence of God? What could I do to create space here that Jesus could move? So the first thing I want you to just recognize about making room for a miracle is it always starts by stretching your faith. The first thing that happened is Jairus looked beyond his circumstances and he began to imagine what might happen if Jesus were in the house. You see, faith is the substance of something that you hope for. All of a sudden, instead of looking at your problem, you just start to imagine what if Jesus walked in to my problem? What might change? He began to look at his circumstances, not based on the resources he had, but on the basis of the resource God had. How many know when we look at our problems through our eyes, there are no answers? But when we look at it from God's perspective, he owns the cattle on a thousand years. He has all authority. He has all power. He has all availability. Faith is always the starting point of making room because without faith it is impossible to please God or to see God work in any way. That's why Jesus would always tell us when you're looking at your life and all the doors seem to shut, quit looking at your problem and start looking up to God. Stop considering your resources and start considering your God. He said, look at the birds. They don't complain. Why? Because they don't look at their world and say, oh, did you see the price of worms lately? <laughs> but they look to their heavenly father. You see, the richest man in the world can't provide for all the birds for one day, and yet God does it every day, and he never gets tired, and he never gets broke. And if you had as much faith as birds, he said, you would never worry again. Because you would know, my Heavenly Father is taking care of me today. That before you call, he has answered. I don't know what your need is, but he already answered before you thought to ask him. The answer is at your door, but do you open the door? That's the question. 
Someone asked, well, does faith create miracles? I think it's more like faith takes the veil off of our eyes to see the miracle that God is already doing. But that unbelief keeps us from seeing. So many times we're blinded by unbelief. See, Jesus was right there, but only one lady touched him, and only one man took him home. How many know there were other sick people that day? There were other desperate people, but they couldn't see Jesus was there. Jesus is here. Can you see? First, we have to remove this veil. This veil comes in the words of Spurgeon when you know God is too wise to be mistaken. He is too great to remain silent. He is too loving to be unkind. And even if you can't see his hand, you can trust his heart. He is moving on your behalf. Do you believe? Do you believe? <laughs> you can say, Pastor, I believe. <laughs> Removing the, the veil said that somewhere in this dark situation, there is a miracle. You heard about the very optimistic little boy who always believed the best. And he was tested one day when his parents brought, had someone bring a whole dump load truck of manure and dump it in the front yard. Well, immediately he started digging as furiously as he could into the manure. And someone asked him, why are you digging into the manure? He said, with this much manure, there must be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> I mean, no, if you look hard enough, God is at work in your life. Amen. Underneath all of the smelly stuff, <laughs> he has put something there, powerful. Secondly, in stretching our faith, though, it means we have to get rid of the fear, the unbelief. The first thing Jesus saw was these mourners who really were just there mocking him. Can you hear their voices? It's too late. It's too late. The little girl's dead. How many have voices inside of your mind that always show up when there's a problem? It's too late. It's too expensive. It's too hopeless. It's too hard. It hurts too much. Anybody see the movie Inside Out? I love that little Disney movie. In fact, I'm doing a sermon series. I'm getting ready for Inside Out. But you notice in that movie, all the, the voices of our mind were little cartoon characters. Whenever we face life, these little voices come around the table and tell us what to think. You've got the voice of guilt. You're such a loser. You deserve what's happening to you. You have... The voice of condemnation. We have the voice of fear. It's awful. You're going to die. All these voices come in, and if you're ever going to have faith, you've got to kick them out of the boardroom of your heart. And you have to invite faith, and you have to invite the Word of God to sit at your table. You have to listen to the voice of faith. The voice of faith said, even though she's dead, when Jesus is with you, it's never too late. Amen. The voice of doubt said, it's already too late because a little girl had died. But the voice of faith says, when Jesus is with you, death is nothing. It's never too late. Can I just tell you that today? It's not too late. Amen. It's not too late for a miracle. It's not too late for a great life. It's not too late for an amazing marriage. It's not too late. When you speak of faith, I like to call faith the rebellion against the status quo. The re one writer calls it the defiant nevertheless. In Haggai, in Habakkuk 317, it says, though the fig tree uh, doesn't blossom and there's no grain in the field, yet will I rejoice in God. This defiance to what you can see. It says, oh, life hurts. Nevertheless, God is good. Amen. How many want to start a rebellion against pain and unbelief? Amen. I'm revolting right now. I'm, I'm planning a coup against the devil. The devil is a liar. And this voice of fear will be under my feet soon. 
One of my mentors is named Wayne Myers, and he said, Faith is dead to doubt, dumb to discouragement, blind to impossibilities, and knows nothing but victory. Let me read it again. Faith is dead to doubts, dumb to discouragement. Have you ever had little kids when their brothers or sisters are telling them something they don't want to hear, they put their fingers in their ears? Daddy, daddy, I'm not listening. <laughs> At least that's all my kids do. When faith starts to hear fear, it plucks up its ears and says, I'm not listening to you, devil. It's blind to the possible, and it knows nothing but victory. It knows nothing but victory. Secondly, we make room for God by moving from despair to deciding, from turning to choosing. Faith requires a choice. Fear simply requires you to give up. Unbelief simply requires you to resign. Depression simply means waving the red flag. But faith means getting up. Faith means a decision. Victims see their life controlled by faith. Hey, Sarah, Sarah, whatever it will be. The faith and victors believe life is determined by choice. Believe that if I can believe God, nothing is impossible. You see, God doesn't always give us instant solutions, but he always gives us next step choices. We wish that God always said, here's the easy button like staples or whatever it is. Just push this button and your problems all go away. But then we would never grow or mature. But God says, I, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll choose, I'll give you one step. When God closes the door, he opens a window. If you'll climb through the window, then there'll be a door. And then when you go through that door, there'll be another door. And if you'll just keep going through doors, someday your miracle will come. Amen? Amen. I want to ask you something. What is your next step for a miracle? What is your next step? It may be something big. It may be something small. But there's always a step. You say, well, I can't do anything about my situation. Well, you can decide how you're going to respond to your situation. You can be still and know that he is God. There's always a choice. The Bible says many are called, few are chosen. I like to say many are called, only a few people make the choices. And those who make the choices see the miracle. And those who complain about the circumstances stay stuck in that situation. I've learned that passivity is the root of all demonic oppression and power. If you want the enemy to destroy your life, here's the secret. Do nothing. Choose nothing. Believe nothing. And you will give him power. Ephesians 4 says, do not give place to the devil. He said, look, every minute you're either making room for God or you're making room for Satan. Every time you do nothing, every time you just say, oh, life stinks. I can't stand my children are driving me crazy. I can't hate, I hate my job. I, uh, what you don't realize is you're making room for the devil. You're making room for fear and discontent and anger. The only way to make room for God is on purpose. To believe in spite of what's happening to you. Remember the four lepers in the Old Testament story who had this leprosy and yet the city was starving because they were surrounded by this army, the Hermians. But one of them said some amazing words. He said, why should we sit here till we die? Let's go over. Who knows? All they can do is kill us anyhow. But who knows if we go over, if God might do something. And when they got off the wall and they started walking, guess what? God moved and the army thought they heard another army. And they all ran for their life. And by the time the four got there, there was nothing but spoils and riches to live and feast on. The moment they got out of their rut and they got moving, 
God started moving. Someone here today, the Lord is saying, get moving. <laughs> Could you turn to someone and say, get moving? <laughs> get moving towards what God has for your life. Because when you move, He moves. When you go out, He shows up. I was uh, in Manila one, one time I was traveling to speak at a, a conference in Manila. I had to be there by 7 o'clock and I had, was on a bus from, uh, I think, the City or somewhere. And of course, I got stuck in the famous Manila traffic. <laughs> and I'm sitting there two hours in a bus. And I'm looking at the clock and it's almost 6 o'clock. And in my mind, I'm already resigning. I'm going to miss the service. I'm not going to be able to minister, even though I had a word from the Lord for the people, and God called me, and I'm stuck here, you know, just barely pulling in, probably still three or four hours away. And I'm sitting there on the bus, depressed, and all of a sudden I hear those words, why do you sit here until you die? <laughs> And the Lord said, get moving. So I stood up, I walked, I said, let me off the bus. I had my service. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this taxi driver shows up. I tell him what's going on. I get, I've never seen this. Was a, mostly the taxi drivers are drivers from hell in Manila. But this one was from heaven. <laughs> and I'm not just joking. But he was driving on sidewalks. He was driving through wrong way streets. <laughs> I just closed my eyes and prayed. <laughs> and at seven on the dot, I was in faith. <laughs> you see, faith never is passive. Faith says, I can do something. I can do something. I can kick out unbelief and I can take the next step. And then the most important choice, I will just I want to summarize because this was really on my heart. You make room for God by what you give. The last words Jesus says in the story is give for something to eat. You know, there's never a time that God does a miracle hardly in the Bible. It doesn't involve a seed. It doesn't involve some way that we give out so that God can give in. As you've heard it said, Sowing seed is God's way of meeting needs. This is Luke uh, 6.38. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. The greatest way to make room for God is to ask, what in this moment can I give? Because the moment you give, you create a space. The Bible says you open the windows of heaven. Over and over, we call it the law of the self-administered return, saying that the faucet of blessing is in your hand. The more you open the faucet by giving, the more the dimensions of heaven's pipeline are open to you and receiving. My grandfather struggled with emphysema. I remember asking the question, he would sit there and struggling, breathing, and and uh, my dad was asking, is, is it hard for you to get air? He says, no, not at all. He said, it's hard for me to get rid of the air in my lungs. <laughs> but the moment I get rid of the air in my lungs, it's easy to receive air back. Isn't that just like a Christian? If, if our giving ever gets right, receiving is automatic. If we can ever release the seed, the crop comes. No farmer would ever say, God, please give me some corn today. And yet never plant a seed. <laughs> they would understand, God says, I have given you corn. It's in that little seed, the miracle of the seed. But until you sow it, you will never see the miracle that will come your way. This is so crucial because our natural response in a time of need is not what it should be. Our natural response is not 
And we give, what is our natural response when we hurt? It's to close our fist and pull in. How many know that the more we're hurting, the less we're usually giving? The more we lack, the more likely we are to make that an excuse to become more self-centered. But what we don't understand is we set off a horrible cycle. The cycle is that the less I have, the less I give, which means the less I'll have, which means the less I'll give, which means the less I'll have, which means the less I'll give. A number of years ago, there was a famine in, in India, and the U.S. sent tons and tons of uh, seed, of corn seed and other seed over to the people who were hungry. Guess what they did with the seed? They ate it all. <laughs> Guess what happened next year? They had even less to eat. And many of us are in that cycle right now. It's called a poverty mentality. Whatever the lack that we have is becomes an excuse and then we begin to fall into the thinking, well, when I have more, I'll give more. No, when you give more, you'll have more. But as long as we're in a poverty mindset, we're going in reverse from our miracle. We're becoming the, the Dead Sea instead of the Jordan River, as we often say. We're receiving, but what happens if we're not giving? We're dying. <laughs> we're dying. So making room for God means daring to believe that you are the manager of God's resources for your life. You determine the joy capacity of your heart. You say, no, I don't want to do that. It's my circumstances. No, it's you. How much joy do I have? Well, how much joy do I give away? How can I be more cheerful? Very simple. Make 10 people cheerful this morning and you have all the cheer you can want. Amen. But it's in your power. Joy is as close as making that person next to you smile. Have you noticed you can't make someone else smile without smiling yourself? Just turn and smile at someone. All of a sudden, some of you looked real grumpy this morning, but all of you are now smiling. A miracle! <laughs> you pull the lever to your, to your blessing capacity. However much you will bless others, you will be blessed. You cannot stop it. It will come to you. When you give forgiveness, what do you get? You get healing. When you don't give forgiveness, what do you get? You get sicker. You get more bitter. When you give hospitality, Jesus said, you get the anointing of the person you were hospitable to. If you receive a prophet in the name of the prophet, what happens? You get a prophet's reward. Amen. So this smart, smart lady in Elijah's day said, Elijah, I'm going to build you a room in my house. So whenever you come through my village, you got a room. Smart lady. She didn't know it, but she was making room for God. Because one day her son would die. But because he had, she had built a room for Elijah, there was a place that Elijah would come and raise her son from. When you build an act of kindness, you don't understand that you're meeting your need for kindness three years from now. When you speak life into someone who's about to give up, you don't know this, but you just received a word of encouragement three months from now. This is how you create wealth in the world. Malik, uh, excuse me, in Haggai 2.19 is one of the most fascinating verses they were in total poverty, and God asked them one question, why is the seed still in the barn? You think the problem is God's not blessing you, but you're the problem because the seed is still in the barn, and until the seed gets out of the barn, there's no nothing growing in the field, and if there's nothing growing in the field, there's no harvest from the field. There is just more lack and more poverty. But if you get the seed out of your barn, friends, I want to tell you today, you are full of seeds inside of you. It's gifts and talents and wisdom and blessings. There is so much seed inside of you, you don't even know. But if you would just release the seed 
Heaven could not contain the blessing that's about to pour on your life in Jesus' name. But the seed is still in the barn. What's up with that? The seed is still in the barn. But we say, God, I need some fruit. He says, but the seed is still in the barn. But my marriage isn't working. Yeah, because the seed is still in the barn. We know this is true with, with finances. I know your pastors preached to you in Malachi 3 9, but you, you know the worst. Uh, will you rob God? Of course. Now, it's kind of ironic that verse because you can't rob God, can you? Because it's all His and it's all coming back to Him and we're leaving and He'll have it all back. <laughs> but He's really saying, Will you rob yourself? By keeping your tithe? Will you rob yourself by keeping the seed in the barn? Why would you want to starve? Why would you want to deny yourself the windows of heaven? That's what he's saying. The moment you bring the whole tithe in the storehouse, he says you have just built room for God. You've just built a barn for God to ship in. <laughs> His abundant resources. You will receive a blessing that you cannot contain. Someone asked, what's the key to your success? And this one friend said, it's called touchbacks. He said, what do you mean by touchbacks? He said, have you ever played that little game when you were a kid? You touch someone and you say, no touchbacks. Oh, man, you never played that game. <laughs> well, a lot of people... When they were kids, they would tag, and you, you, the idea is whoever you touch would freeze, but they would say, no touch. But the thing is, whenever you touch God and say, no touchbacks, guess what? He never listens to you. And the moment you touch God, God says, I do touchbacks every time. And you touch me with little, and I touch you with much, because I have a bigger toucher than you. That's just what a blessed life is. It's just touchbacks. It's just God touching you back today from what you gave to yesterday. How many touchbacks do you have in the pipeline today for tomorrow? Giving not only makes room for God to do miracles in our lives, but in others' lives. Let me just read 2 Corinthians 9-7. If we could see that verse you must each decide. Everybody say decide. Uh, the King James says purpose. Don't do this by what you can afford. Do this by what you can decide. The purpose. How much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Verse 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over. Can you say plenty left over? <laughs> Can you think of those 12 basketfuls of Jesus' miracle? Yes. Plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. 3 verse 10. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Can you say increase? Increase. Your resources. And then produce a great harvest of generosity. Thank you. Yes, you will be enriched. Say enriched. Enriched. In every way, so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. That's verse 12. So two good things will result from this ministry. I'm thinking right now of your Christmas in the Philippines, right? Amen. So, so two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. When we, we give, we're creating space for ourselves, but we're also creating space in 